Tala Falava, my name is Luaipo and Matalasi. I'm a practicing lawyer in Samoa, currently uh, working as an associate for the Hawaii Law Firm. I was admitted as a barrister and solicitor, Supreme Court of Samoa in 2016. Earlier this year, I became a member of the Young Commonwealth Lawyers Association. And the work of the Young Commonwealth Lawyers Association is we get to interview executive members of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association. It's an in serious conversation. And today, uh, I'm happy to be interviewing Rodney Hanson QC from Auckland, New Zealand. Just a brief uh, introduction. Uh, Rodney Hanson, uh, he was a former president of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association from 1996 to 1999. And interestingly, Rodney sits on the Court of Appeal of three of our Pacific Island jurisdictions, the Court of Appeal of Kiribati, the Kingdom of Tonga, and also the Court of Appeal of Samoa. Okay, uh, Talofalava, Rodney, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, and Talofalava to you too, Anne. Thank you. Okay, let's start, let's get started with our interview. Uh, Rodney, uh, would you like to share uh, where and in what capacity do you practice? Um, currently, and for the last uh, eight years, um, I have been in sole practice as a barrister uh, in Auckland, uh, New Zealand. Um, having retired from the High Court bench in 2014. Uh, and as a sole practitioner, I mainly do um, alternative dispute resolution work, uh, arbitrations and mediations. Uh, but I also do uh, some inquiry work, investigations, uh, special reports and so on for government and private organizations. Thank you. So could, could you please uh, share with us one or two high points of your career? Uh, well, um, it, it, I suppose it depends on what you mean by high points. Uh, and um, because high, high, high points can include matters that give uh, uh, s someone like me enormous personal satisfaction, uh, but mean nothing to uh, others. But the, the, the um, uh, what I might describe as hard points that might be of more, of more general interest, um, I've thought of considered two. Um, uh, one was uh, being part of a legal team uh, which uh, successfully obtained a court injunction in 1985, um, which uh, stopped um, an all-black rugby tour of uh, South Africa uh, at a time when the whole issue of sporting contact with South Africa was um, uh, a highly controversial issue and um, and there was a lot of pressure to uh, eliminate those sporting contacts in order to put pressure domestically on South Africa to change its apartheid. So to achieve that was um, against the odds, might I say, was something that gave me enormous satisfaction. Uh, and the second, which had some uh, international significance was to uh, be a member of the legal team uh, uh, who acted for Greenpeace um, in a claim against France following the sinking of the Rainbow Warrior. Uh, and for that purpose, um, I, I worked with, among others, uh, um, a man called, uh, an American lawyer called Lloyd Cutler, who was uh, in his day a most eminent individual, and that was a great privilege for me. Thank you. So your career is from a practicing lawyer to becoming a judge, 
and yeah. being involved in international law. Yeah. Would you know how your professional colleagues describe you? Um, it depends whether I'm there or not, and I, 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 um, I have uh, been uh, the beneficiary of um, sort of farewell and valedictory speeches and those kind of things. So I have heard what, uh, and, and people have said very nice things about me. Um, uh, what they say when I'm not there, I don't know. And um, I, I would like to think that uh, uh, they feel that I have uh, uh, made a worthy contribution in the various capacities in which I've practiced law. But uh, as for the detail of it, I'd prefer not to say, Anne. Thank you. Uh, so those are the questions in relation to your general practice and what you're involved yeah. in. So we're now yeah. um, moving on to, to your involvement with uh, Commonwealth Lawyers Association. Yeah. Can, you, can you tell us how long have you been a member of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association and how did you first get involved? Yeah, um, I have been a member, I suppose it goes back to about 19, about the same time, 1984, 85. Uh, and, um, it started when I was, when uh, the New Zealand Law Society had successfully uh, bid to host the 1990 Commonwealth Law Conference. Um, and um, I was asked uh, to um, become a co-convener of the organizing committee um, together with uh, uh, Sean Elias, now Dame Sean Elias, who subsequently became the uh, Chief Justice of New Zealand, recently retired. And so um, as the conveners of the organising committee for the next conference, we became ex officio members of the Council of the um, Commonwealth Lawyers Association. So from about that time, um, I started to attend council uh, meetings in London. And in 1986, I went to my first uh, Commonwealth uh, um, law conference, uh, which was in Ocho Rios in Jamaica. So that's how it all began. You've mentioned your experience as a co-convener for a conference in New Zealand. Could you talk a little about your experience of that conference and other Commonwealth Lawyers Association events and activities you were involved in? Um, well, uh, the, uh, what, what's wonderful about the Commonwealth Law uh, conferences is that they, uh, they take on the character of uh, the host country so uh, every one of them is is very very different and uh, as a matter of policy uh, in the past I'm not quite sure about now but uh, during the time that I was inv actively involved in the association uh, the conference moved from one region to another so it would be Africa the Caribbean uh, Oceania or Australasia, Europe, and so on. And um, so uh, the conferences were always a wonderful experience from that point of view. Um, I, I think it's worth making the point that um, uh, in my view, the, the, the great strength of the um, Commonwealth Lawyers Association, or one of the great strengths of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association, is that both uh, professional associations, law societies and the like, and individuals um, aren't associated with it for the purpose of personal advancement or professional gain, um, as is the case with some of the other international 
uh, professional organisations. Rather, it is an organisation which is founded very much on the on the principles which underpin the Commonwealth itself, which is uh, uh, to provide a network whereby uh, different jurisdictions help one another, um, uh, not in order to achieve a benefit, but in order to give something to those who perhaps are unable to uh, provide for themselves. And so by that means the, the strong uh, can provide something for the weak, the wealthy, for the poor, uh, the, the more uh, developed jurisdictions can assist those who are still finding their way. And so it is in that that I have uh, always strongly identified with uh, the Commonwealth Law Conference uh, uh, and the Commonwealth Lawyers Association. But the other, the other point that I wanted to say, um, and is that um, uh, ultimately uh, the association works because of the people uh, who work in, within it. And, um, and over the years, I have worked with some fantastic individuals who have been uh, passionate in pursuing the Commonwealth ideals. And uh, that, that it is those individuals who really made it work. Interesting. Thank you for that. I understand it, it, it should be uh, for developing countries should be encouraged to join the Commonwealth Law Association, yeah. right? Because of yeah. the benefits you mentioned. Yeah. Okay. So, Junior Time, is there an area which is a particular issue within the Commonwealth that you have an interest in or have worked on? I don't. I. I um, I don't think so, really, when I, if I reflect on it, uh, and that there is no sort of one uh, particular area or issue that I have uh, taken a, uh, an interest in, apart from um, what I've actually uh, done uh, incidentally over the last seven or eight years, where I've um, had a very strong focus on the island jurisdictions of the Pacific. And it has been a great privilege and an honour to uh, sit on the courts of those jurisdictions and come to achieve a much better understanding than I had before, I say to my shame, um, of, of what those what those nations uh, uh, like yeah, Samoa, uh, Tonga and Kiribati, um, their culture, their people, um, and, their, and the particular issues that uh, they have to deal with and address. So that, that I suppose if I were to identify a particular area of the Commonwealth, it would be that. Um, uh, were, were you going to, uh, I, I was going to say something about some of the particular activities of the uh, Commonwealth uh, Lawyers Association. Uh, were you going to ask me about that or should I, yes, should yeah, I you can, you can volunteer them that's myself? Fine. Yes, that's fine, Rodney. Yeah. Go ahead. Because in, in um, you know, when I think about what, no doubt, uh, there are different sorts of projects now, but uh, one, one that I recall going back to my council days that uh, we were always, was always an item on the council uh, agenda was, was the legal law box scheme in which um, we gathered together books from uh, uh, the UK and other countries who were, who who had a surplus of books or who could uh, for whom um, uh, a particular textbook had become out of print but could be of value to another country and we always uh, were very busy um, making that work and 
sending books around the Commonwealth. But the other, the other uh, two uh, specific activities that I wanted to mention, which were highlights of the time that I was president, uh, was in 1997 when uh, we were represented at the uh, Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Edinburgh. And uh, uh, we had our own little um, sort of stall. There was, a, it was some, there was something that was akin to an exhibits hall and the Commonwealth Lawyers Association had an exhibit there and we were visited by Prince Charles to the excitement and, you know, of everybody. Still got a photo of me and Prince Charles. Um, and at that, at that conference, there was um, a resolution reached and an agreement reached that uh, we should join together with other Commonwealth organisations and um, hold a symposium, uh, which took place uh, the following year um, in 1998 at Latimer House, uh, which was uh, focused on developing uh, guidelines and standards which would ensure that, uh, uh, which would uh, provide um, a universal uh, declaration of uh, the supremacy of parliament and the way in which uh, the courts, uh, the ju judiciary would support parliament. And those guidelines that were developed there by the Commonwealth representatives of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association, the Commonwealth Judges and Magistrates Association, Commonwealth parliamentarians, one of whom was your own, your very own Misa Telefoni uh, Retzlaff, who I think was Attorney General of Samar at that time, uh, and the Parliamentary Journalists, I think, Association. And we worked together over a period of five or six days to uh, produce this set of guidelines. That, um, and uh, um, which has on occasions when I have been uh, sitting on the bench actually been quoted to me to my satisfaction. Thank you, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. Just moving on to the final part of our interview. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Yes. What do you wish you had known as a junior practitioner given your experience? Um, well, to be, to be honest, uh, and I, I, I don't think, looking back, that there is that there is much that I that would have uh, changed the way I I approached the law. Um, so I, in in that sense, I don't have any regrets. Um, um, I, I feel as though I have been extremely fortunate uh, in that I have had a, a rich and varied career. I have had, I have spent time as a practitioner appearing in the courts. I have spent time sitting on the bench. And then I have had these last um, eight years uh, so far not out um, doing a whole range of different things. Um, but if I were to be dispensing advice to uh, a younger practitioner um, of, of what is the most important thing, it's the same kind of advice I'd think I'd give to anyone in any walk of, uh, in, in, in any profession or vocation. Uh, one is to well, the first is to work hard and always, always produce the very best you can. 
Uh, and the second to, is to always be mindful of the fact, particularly in the law, that the most valuable thing that you build for yourself and possess is your reputation. And reputations are uh, hard won and easily lost. So it is a matter of uh, working hard, um, always acting with the utmost integrity and adhering to the highest ethical standards of the profession. And if you do that, then whichever area of law you go into or which works for you, then you will succeed to the best of your ability. And if I were talking to, um, uh, to those who practice in the areas that I did, which, you know, in the area of litigation and as an advocate, uh, in a sense, I'd be giving the same kind of advice, but with a special application to um, uh, appearing as an advocate. Um, and that is the importance, the vital importance of preparation. Mm. Uh, you can never be too well prepared uh, when you go to court. Mm. That's how you're going to provide the most assistance to the judge. Mm. And, and I would identify perhaps one of the key uh, critical weaknesses that I sometimes find in not just younger and more inexperienced advocates, but uh, unfortunately in some who uh, have been in practice for quite some time. Uh, and that is the importance of not becoming bewitched uh, by the virtues of your own argument, because the, the weakest point uh, in any argument that you take to court is the strongest point in your opponent's argument. And it is uh, always vitally important never to get car carried away with your own, with the virtues and the merits of your own case and to examine very, very closely what the other side has got to say. Because time and time again, um, I have had the experience of seeing advocates who have done a wonderful job of presenting their own case only to be completely torpedoed by their failure to address the key points of their opponent's case. It's kind of avoidance thing that we're, we can all be uh, guilty of, uh, avoiding the tough stuff. But in the law, it's fatal. Thank you for that advice. That's really helpful, especially for someone like me. Only six years of practicing. I have got a long way to go. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> yes. Can I just finish then by saying that yeah, that's you're, fine. You're, you're absolutely right, Anne. And what, what I can tell you from my vantage point is that Every day still, every day that I go into my chambers or I sit in an arbitration or I go to a mediation, every day I learn something new. You, it's, it's, it's a profession in which you never stop learning. If you, stop, if you think you've learned everything that there is to know, then it's time to get out. So, which is probably my cue to finish. <laughs> thank you so much, Rodney, for your time. And thank you for answering my questions. And, and also on behalf of the, of the Young Commonwealth lawyers, I'd like to thank you for making the time to be involved in this uh, and serious uh, conversation. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, Anne. Thank you. Thank you very much.